Welcome to the Dennis Report. Thanks for tuning in. The guest today is Fred McDonald, Cree First Nations from Alberta, and he's landed in Fredericton for a while, and we're going to explore several themes. So, Fred, thanks for the time. My pleasure. Thanks for uh, inviting me. Good. Um, do you always look this dapper with the hat and the suspenders, and or is it just a Christmas festive season? Uh, I just kind of found the hat. I bought it a long time ago, and I just thought, oh, I'm going to throw that on, and I just decided to wear it. And I thought, I look kind of like Frank a little bit, <laughs> but you know who I'm talking about, yeah, Mr. Sinatra. Yeah. Anyways, no, I'm I. I wear many hats, literally, like I like oh, cowboy hats when I'm in Calgary. I like hunting hats when I'm in the bush, of course, and then of course I. I love sports, so I love. I have like Giants hats or 49ers hats or oh, American uh, sports. No yeah, Canadian love, sports. Mm, you know what? No, <laughs> not really. So being from out west, I'm a Calgary fan. Whether it's uh, the Stampeders for Canadian football or the Flames, or no way, no. <laughs> Don't want to go there. <laughs> Have fun. Um. So the Western theme, and uh, as we were prepping to get started, um, you talked about wanting to speak about your uh, time as a CEO. So why don't we start there? Because um, in doing some homework, and you kindly uh, shared this book with me, so Fred has a book, we'll give you links to how to find it on Amazon. Um, that uh, and my opening comment to you is about how, um, from reading this, that you live in between um, different cultures, um, tr strong traditions, uh, all of which could guide us in the future, especially as your role as artist. But um, he wanted to start with the notion of, in your time as a CEO, can you share that with us? What uh, <laughs> going into it, I the question, my main question was how do how do I be a CEO? How do I lead people? And uh, being leader, actually, um, I realized comes natural to me. My father actually was a general contractor and owned a few companies over the years, and. Um, I watched him quite intently over the years. I didn't realize I was watching him. I was learning from him kind of innately. Yes. And um, he uh, tr treated his employees very well. Mm. And so when I started, when I took on the role of CU, I treated them the same way my dad would treat anybody. And I remember, too, working in the industry, and I remember on construction and you know, you work for the assholes and you want to beat the shit out of them later and or drop a pipe wrench on them from up on one of the structures. And um, just I just remember, you know, how would I want to be treated as an employee by the boss? Mm -hmm. So that was my mantra going into it, is treating the people properly. So this starts in 2000 and... 2008. So you've got a, a fairly significant lifetime work experience at different levels when you enter into that yes. moment. I worked for, uh, in the oil industry for approximately 15 years yeah. in construction and in maintenance. And then, of course, uh, I worked for St. Crude and I worked for the, with the union, mm -hmm. Local 488 out of Edmonton. And then I worked a little bit with TransCanada Pipelines with their pipelines all across Canada. Um, you know, all of those offered different hmm. um, strategies, offered different um, ways of working, and so on. But and, and you're about to become the CEO on the First Nations um, Reserve of? Fort Mackay First Nation. Yes, but a CEO of? Uh, Fort Mackay Group of Companies. Okay. So there's a, when I started, there was, uh, I think, six business units, mm -hmm. uh, 300 employees, mm -hmm. uh, our revenue stream was 150 million dollars a year mm -hmm. so going can you imagine going <laughs> from an artist sitting in my studio painting all of a sudden I'm sitting in an office and I've got 300 people 150 million dollar revenue stream and I'm going all right let's do it so after I after I taught myself I learned and I just went okay it's this I can do this I just um, took it one step at a time and um, but at the same time, I, I did, did, didn't jump into it put having a team behind me. I, a friend of mine, Mar she's a doctor now, a, a business, an Aboriginal business, uh, Marie Delorme, I actually asked her about a few things and she kind of counseled me as I went through my job. And that was really good. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I was smart enough to know that 
I can't really do this on my own. Mm -hmm. And one of the first things I did as a CEO was I set up a senior management team, which they did not have at the time. And um, I, I, you know, I fall back into other people's mantras, like um, somebody asked John F. Kennedy one time what makes him so great, and he replied, and, you know, I'm not great, I just surround myself with great people. And so I thought, wow, that's the best way to do it, just surround myself with, with great people. So I took uh, a lot of time, I had a five week layover or Transition over period. transition period with uh, the other C CEO. And what I did was I went out to the business units and I spent a week out in each one, just observing, watching, listening, talking to people, seeing what they wanted, listening to what they wanted. And then, you know, some of them w fit into my previous experiences and some of them were brand new. Mm -hmm. For example, like running heavy equipment, those uh, 400 ton trucks and stuff like that. So there was some stuff that I was comfortable with and there was some stuff I wasn't. Mm -hmm. But uh, I knew that at that time that it's best to let the professionals, the people that knew what they were doing, run it. I'm definitely not a micromanager. A manager. I do not like micromanagers. Mm -hmm. So um, that was good. I, I just let them continue doing what they did. And over a period of time, I learned who were good managers, who were assholes. Yeah. I got rid of them, yeah. and um, I put in very positive, forward-thinking, proactive um, type of people. So the, the group or the person that hired you, were they, um, were they intuitively correct to kind of pluck you out of your element and stick you into this new element because you would bring some intangibles to the management of this group of companies? I was an artist. I thought, you know, how does a person sell art? This was my... Uh, something that was an enigma to me and I thought okay well business people have money so I aligned myself with the Calgary Aboriginal Prof uh, Professional Association and um, then I aligned myself with the Canadian Council Ab uh, for Aboriginal Business and um, after a month this lady calls me up the executive director and says oh the guy that was running the tournament they let him go uh, or he quit, and so uh, we'd like you to run the tournament. I went, I've never run a tournament. What am I going to do? <laughs> and so I thought, okay, let me think about it, because I don't make a decision like this. It's just something I don't want to do. Yeah. So I thought about it, and a month later, she calls me. I said, what's your decision? I says, well, I don't really want to do it. And then she says, well, we need somebody. I said, okay, another challenge. So from that first tournament, I started organizing like five-day Aboriginal events and stuff like that and, and golf tournaments and treaty days and uh, I guess the chief and other people noticed how well I ran them. So from there they kind of knew what my skill set was for, for leading people and for organizing things. Uh, it turns out I've been organizing things right from when I was a kid. <laughs> I remember I'd get a phone call you know on the member of the phones off the wall I'd get a phone call and uh, my buddy said, oh, well, let's play baseball today. I said, great idea. And they says, okay, can you organize it? I was always organizing things. So I said, okay, I'll organize. I called everybody up and said, we're having a game. We'll meet at four o'clock at the field. Basically, we had a field. Yeah. It wasn't a baseball field. It was just like an yeah. open field. So right from when I was a little kid, I was organized, always organizing things. Can we play in the theme a little bit about... Um, um outside culture's perception of First Nations, um, they might not quite understand you're running a series of businesses as a corporation. Um, that's not what comes top of mind in, in the general white culture's awareness of First Nations because media will work a certain angle. Um, so how professional has First Nations industry and business become? My God, it's, uh, you know what, you look at, uh, let's take the 2010 Winter Olympics in Vancouver. There was one fellow there who kind of got the different nations from Vancouver area together and helped to run a very smooth operation. You know, I was, I can't remember his name, I think it was Joseph something or other, anyways. Uh, but, you know, they've been running businesses in that area. You know, you think about the Aboriginal people that have existed 
The trade routes in North America are quite extensive. They go back mm -hmm. thousands of years. And, um, you know, so businesses existed. The Aboriginal people know how to deal with pe other Aboriginal people and how to deal with businesses. And, you know, trading of uh, conch shells or uh, trading of... Uh, when the Germans brought over their silver, you know, you end up with uh, German silver all over North yeah. America. So for Aboriginal people, the, the idea of running a business, it's always been there. Mm -hmm. So, And then in Fort McMurray, um, with the Northeastern Aboriginal, uh, Northeastern Alberta Aboriginal Business Association, there's about 130 Aboriginal uh, companies that are full members. You have to be an Aboriginal company to be a full member of this organization. And I'll tell you what, professional, right right to the end. Uh, mm -hmm. Financial statements, uh, safety programs, um, management of people, um, you know, efficiency of getting jobs done. That you just, um, you couldn't ask for a better group of people. To, and uh, most of those are right from our, from the Northeastern Alberta region. And, you know, running businesses are just something that they want to do. In the cultural space then, is it, is it consistent that First Nations business would also sustain its cultural roots? Well, it, the fear is one of assimilation. So do you have to do business the way white people do business? Or can you do business the way First Nations does it? Or is that a dumb question because business is just business and people get on? Well, it's very interesting. That's a really good question, actually. Uh, number one is to start like a meeting, for example. <laughs> We'd pray. We'd have a prayer. Um, in non-native culture, um, it's very, very rare that they'd start a meeting with a prayer. Uh, we'd be, you know, we for lunch or for for suppers, we we we'd, we'd uh, bless the food. So that's a very distinct difference right there. But on the other end of things, when you know when you do uh, you have a board meetings and stuff, the Roberts rules come into effect. You know, you got to have two motions to pass any action or something like that. And then, uh, so uh, the transition for First Nations to do something like that, they, they're they equally adept at the traditional culture of Aboriginal people and then doing business in a traditional manner within the mainstream. Is there something to be gained for a white business culture to um, adopt more of First Nations business approach? I'm thinking especially in, in the balance with environment. Is that a fair place to go play in? Is there something what? Is that a fair place to go play in? Well, you know what? You, one culture adopting another culture's uh, way of doing things might be v quite difficult. Mm -hmm. um, but can they adopt or integrate they, some you of know the what? pieces? Uh, some people are integrating. Um, Without losing their identity. Uh, you know, I don't know what <clears throat> most most of these organizations are doing, you know. Uh, let's take Shell Canada for, or Shell at the time. Uh, Shell Canada at that time or Albion Sands, which is no, no longer there because it got purchased by um, CNRL. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, they had this whole thick book on how to be a manager. Mm -hmm. They get indoctrinated and become brainwashed. It's really weird because I had a really good friend who I met in university and um, she was all about learning about Aboriginal people and, and wanting to help Aboriginal people and then she got hired by the oil company and her intent was to work with the Aboriginal community and before too long, like within months, I, I, can, I seen a change. It was really weird. It was just like, uh, you know, to say the, the, the worst situation would be they, they, they felt just like a robot. And it's unfortunate. So for an Aboriginal company to utilize tools about that come from the non-aboriginal community is easy because there's books and books and books in there but for non-native people non-aboriginal companies to do that there's very few of them there's one you know there are people out there doing that and helping other businesses helping communities and stuff um, um, with working with aboriginal people uh, but it's kind of a new industry it's kind of a new way of doing things mm. I often wonder with uh, the challenges big industry have with dealing with the environment and then the duty to consult, especially when dealing with First Nations um, turf, <clears throat> that 
I keep hoping there would be a breakthrough if industry would just see it the First Nation way, as best I understand that, for the relationship with the land and the water, to integrate that value system into their business practices rather than doing it token and doing their social corporate responsibility. <clears throat> but it's like an obstacle to be overcome rather than something to fully integrate into our daily practices because then we would all benefit from that. Do you have any stories or examples where that uh, duty to consult is treated like an obstacle? Because you mentioned working with Syncrude, you mentioned um, pipeline work, mm -hmm. and that's very top of mind nationally right yeah, now. Yeah, it's uh, one of those, you know, uh, the uh, Canada East Pipeline, uh, the Northern Gateway Pipeline, which got shot down, and then, of course, the Trans Mountain Pipeline. And uh, the Keystone Pipeline, those all, you know, they're all on hold basically right now. Yeah. Or, yeah. And, you know, I think they're on hold because it depends on which government gets in the next. You could have a Canada, uh, Canada East Pipeline push through. Um, so, you know. Um, Are pipelines a good thing? Yes, totally. Um, the, the, you, you know, you look at a map of pipelines of North America and you can't believe how many pipelines there are already that exist. And they're all old. They're like 20, 30, 40, 50 years old. And they're, it's one of those things that uh, they're there. People just don't realize it. Like one of the, I was surprised at working in, um, uh, with TransCanada Pipelines, how close the, the uh, right of way for a pipeline goes by the southern part of Regina. It's right through a suburb, right, at the, right on the edge of a suburb. And it's like, okay. Um, the pipelines uh, over the years have been pretty lucky because, you know, they've had some bursts and most of them have been away from any populated uh, area, but they've learned from them. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, pipelines are a viable and safe way to send a product from one area to another. Mainstream media will grab hold of a pipeline break and um, give it lots of attention. and. Um, it would then tie to the relationship with uh, the leak hitting a certain water system. Um, there's several stories over the past 10 years. Think even in the Facebook world, assuming that it's accurate, or in the social media world, that there's been reports done of uh, the number of pipeline leaks in the past 10 years, and they'll show that same map with all the different leaks. And of course, the impact of oil on water over a long term. So somewhere in your heart, you've resolved that this is the best way to move that product, because it's also key to the Canadian yeah. economy. And right now, in early uh, or late November, early December, that's a major issue going on in Canada about right. the impact of Alberta's oil on the Canadian economy. Well, it's interesting because of the fact that uh, the key Aboriginal communities that support the oil industry are in the same region as the oil industry. And as you get farther and farther away from that center, you get less and less support for the oil industry. And you, you come out here and you talk about dirty oil, as they call it, you know, anywhere from outside of the Alberta, Saskatchewan region. And, and there's a lot of the native people, a lot of the, they don't support that. Um, but, you know, that's one of those things, you have to make your own decision. Are you, are you gonna be able to drive your car? <laughs> Will you be able to, you know, make, um, materials and manufactured products oil is everywhere without oil you, we couldn't have this program because you wouldn't be able to record um, your, your show so the, all those products are part and partial of oil good points so um, and then safety and pipelines so can you explore a bit why you th why you feel pipelines are safe because we don't get to hear that side of the argument much the yeah. activists usually uh, drive most of that narrative well, I, you know, they have instruments. Uh, they have, uh, they'll have a pump, and then they'll have another pumping station, and then they'll have a bunch of uh, valves, like pneumatic valves, uh, that if there's a decrease in pressure, they know that there's a leak, and those valves will shut off almost instantly. And you don't hear really about the little, the little leaks where these, you know, the little holes that break out and stuff like that. They, they probably do exist all, all along the lines. I don't know if they do, but I imagine that they do because metal will erode inside and outside. And uh, the bigger, you, you hear about the bigger leaks because of the one valve might not work. You know, it's just maintenance. You, you, 
they need a maintenance structure that would work to make sure that those valves are operating. So the decrease in the pressure in the pipe would send signals instantly and they'd have a panel with all, you know, they'd have a control center. So I, I think pipelines are um, very safe. Uh, there is going to be, you know, it's inherent with any kind of construction that there's going to be problems. Um, you know, I've even talked about having double wall piping as an idea, and some of these companies, some of these pipelines are double wall. So if there's a, a leak on the inside wall, there's a sensor that goes in from the outside wall to, to pick up on the pipes, mm -hmm. to pick up on the pressure. So, uh, you know, those kind of things, I think, make it safer. It's like, if you send it by rail, look what happened at La Lac Magentic. Uh, what is it, 47 people are killed there? Yeah. And, uh, and then four or five years down the road, it's kind of forgotten. Now they're sending uh, oil on rails, and you, you look at what Notley wants to do now. She wants to buy whole bunch of more um, cars to send, you know, as a temporary fix because of uh, our federal government's not doing anything with the oil, uh, with the pipe, mm -hmm. uh, with the pipelines and stuff like that. So she wants to get more rail cars and send them through via rail. But the railway systems, the infrastructure is old. Yes. So there's problems. There's going to be, there's going to be more accidents on the rails because the, the more people, more more time you send out a, a car full of oil, it's going to be going over the same s system and using it more and more and more. It's going to wear out, or you know, you, you're, they're sending oil through uh, tanker trucks. Yeah. Uh, I don't even have to talk about that because that's that comes down to driver error yeah. or, or road conditions, the weather. You know, there's so many variables. So pipelines are the safest way to send oil anywhere. And they do it, your pipes go from here all the way to South America. So, and all over North America and all over South America. So in that spirit, the notion of our dependence on oil, do you foresee a time when we can get off of oil? You know, we're, we're going to need oil to transport our food from Mexico in the wintertime. We're going to need uh, oil to transport our big boats that come from Taiwan or China or or Saudi Arabia unfortunately to you know uh, but the thing is is that you're still going to need that you're still going to need oil okay thanks for that good can we take a different tack different oh, just one one mention one thing is that uh, with the uh, pipeline um, east you know one of the problems I think out here is that you know I'm f all for sending the oil to New Brunswick but it's hard for uh, like Irving Oil they, they, I think they're bringing in 700,000 a day one-third comes from Saudi Arabia one-third from the States and one-third of course comes from Canada which most people don't realize I bet any money on that yeah, by rail by rail of course but the thing is is that uh, they don't have the facility here to take the bitumen and make it into oil. That's probably one of the reasons why. And then to do that, it would cost more. So if you want to have gasoline at the pump, or I noticed today it was a hundred dollar one. You know, sometimes it's up in dollar thirty nine or something like that. I remember one time buying gas here, and if you buy the oil from the west, uh, the bitumen it's going to be a little bit more. So, you know, yeah, the consumer is basically depicting where the oil comes from. It's, it's not the oil companies that are doing it. It's the consumer. That's an interesting point. Um, Atlanta, Canada is such a small market for the size of the oil refinery that the Irving's run out of St. John that um, we get blown by the winds of much larger markets all the time and their ability to access markets. But lacking in our province in particular is any in-depth conversation on the impact of uh, the Energy East pipeline on that um, oil refinery in St. John and the impact on the environment. We get clips and sound bites and, and such, but there's no place to really have an in-depth conversation where people can address their concerns and find out confidence about pipelines and then get through the duty to consult and move forward. So yeah. 
we seem to have atrophied ourselves in a complex system. Well, yeah, there's an atrophy here, but you know, when they wanted to do some fracking here, that got shut down. The native people stopped that with, you know, environmentalists and concerned citizens. Mm -hmm. They put they put that to a stop, and rightly so, because you're you're sticking chemicals underground into the water table, into your into the water you're drinking, mm -hmm. and that's absolutely wrong. And you know what? There's times out there when corporations don't care about what people are, the health of people. They care about their bottom line, mm -hmm. and you know those kind of things have to be stopped. Mm -hmm. So. So let's take a totally different tack. Is that okay? Absolutely. Let's let's slide into um, the role of men in your life, your grandfather and your father, and, and you as a father, and because uh, it's something I we don't often get a chance to talk about here, and yet it's one of those major themes that really uh, run under the current, whether we're talking about oil or how decisions are made, because we all bring with us the influences of our lives to this point in time, and those that help guide us. And uh, I'd love to hear your your stories, um, some of which you've put in your book, um, and what's come to guide you and what seems to resonate now as you enter your early 60s. Well, let's start with my grandfather. He was a very interesting man. Um, I wouldn't say he was a loner, but he sure loved being in the bush alone. I think... Um, you know the the bush the bushman the the trapper and the hunter and the the mountain man they love being out in the bush they're their own man uh, you know they live and die by their own decisions if you're out there in the middle of winter and you got to cross an open there's an open piece of water you got to know how to get it from one side of that river to the other and if you don't make the right decisions well nobody hears from you ever again so you know I really have a lot of respect for what my grandfather went through because. Uh, you know, being raised in that time when uh, they subsisted off the land. You know, as much as native people lived off the land, they lived with the land. Mm -hmm. So my grandfather understood living with the land and that helped them to live off the land. And I think that's just part of being an Aboriginal person who's raised in the bush. And what window of time would that be? That would be, well, he was born in 1905, and so basically till his death in 1986, I think he passed away. And I, I never remember dates. That's okay. And this is northern Alberta? And this is northern Alberta. So, okay. you know, he told me stories like um, when he was youngster, his father uh, took him to a, um, not far from where they lived, on the Athabasca River. It was about 80 miles north of Fort McMurray. Um, he, they take they, every winter or every fall. They'd go to this one spot and they'd sit and they'd be for three days. He told me that the 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 caribou would walk by and walk by and walk by. There was you know the caribou herds were were migrating uh, during the winter uh, for the winter coming winter to go south and you know. And he said they would sit on a hill and they'd pick off a few animals that would subsist that would help them to survive through the winter. And as he got older and when the oil sands and the oil industry and all these other um, kind of economic drivers came, the, 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 it became less and less to a point now where to see a caribou in, that, in the region is very rare. It's like seeing a Sasquatch, like, wow, I see in a caribou today. <laughs> so it's like, so we get pretty excited by it. But, um, you know, back then it's, it's one of those things. And, um, you know, just the idea of the, him living, having to make decisions when he was 15 years old. Like uh, there was one time uh, he told a story about um, there was a knock at the cabin door. It was a blizzard outside. And they were surprised. No one normally travels in that type of weather. They're, you know, pretty smart. Native people are pretty smart. They're like bears. If it's going to be cold, they're going <laughs> to hibernate. And uh, it was this fella uh, who had to let his plane land on the the river because he couldn't fly any further. And he had medicine that at one time Fort Chippewa was a bigger community than Fort McMurray and needed to take some medicine from Fort Chippewa to Fort McMurray, there was some kind of epidemic. Uh, and my grandfather, you know, just without thinking, he's 15 years old, he goes and gets his, his four dogs, puts his team together and takes his person to Fort McMurray with the medicine. 
you never read about that because my grandfather just, you know, he did what he had to do. And how far distance was that? 80 miles. That's a long ways, but you know, you, you could you could do it in a 80 miles with a good team of dogs. The road or the the path would always already be there uh, because we they travel it quite readily. And not only my my grandfather, or my father, or his father, hit um, my grandfather's father. They, there'd be other trappers that use the same route along the Athabasca River. It was you know, the Athabasca River was a highway back. You know, you talk you hear about native people saying no, that was our highway at the time. So, um, so my grandfather was very important. He taught me a lot of stuff. I spent a lot of time with him. First Nations culture and its teachings, as it integrates or assimilates into the, this larger culture. So when you talked about global community, yeah, because your children are living, that is their immediate world. And it's very different from your childhood growing up in bush and hearing grandfather's stories. So soon enough, your grandfather, you know, and you'll be passing on those stories. Does does the teachings, do the teachings sustain themselves through the generations? Well, I could talk about the elders. We'll start there, I suppose. Um, the traditions in the community I'm from basically are lost. Um, you know, we, we grew up, uh, a lot of our elders went, if they went to school, they went to residential school. Mm -hmm. So their identity was beat the, sh the shit was beat right out of them basically. so you so you know some of those survivors yes i do it, they're they're in our community and um so they lost a lot we lost a lot of our of our identity that way and with me and my children is that um i don't um per se take them to events and stuff like that to teach them aboriginal ways of life it's they're not going to live in that world but at the same time they know about it they, you know they they recognize that uh, you know they that they, they are an aboriginal people my father and my mother when we were young could have lived on the reserved on the reserve but they they made a really conscious decision that they didn't want their children to be raised in, in that environment because of the dysfunction there's a lot of uh, low self-esteem at the time there's there wasn't much work you know trapping was very important back then and um, we uh, you know yeah if you didn't get enough fur for for the f during the season during the winter you know you had a hard time with it during the year and a lot of our people actually uh, they would go live once the oil company started up they worked during the summer in some aspect with the oil companies but my mom and father uh, wanted to raise us outside of the First Nation community. And well, you know, I, I often think about what would my life have been if I was raised in, the, in, a, in a community, in the, yeah, in the Fort Mackay community. And uh, I'm not sure if I would be the same person. Uh, I think I would be, but it's hard to say because I've always been my own thinker. I've always done things my own way. So, you know, going to finish high school, two, I got a master's degree, you know. Um, so, you know, those kind of things, my mom, mom and dad made that decision that we would go to school beyond just high school, and that's what their hope. My sister's got a business degree, um, but my other brothers at the same time, my brothers, they, um, you know, they got trades in the oil industry, and that has done them well. So, you know, education was very important. And uh, one of the things that our average, our community struggles with is that, uh, you know, I think we're around 45% success uh, graduation rate for high school students, and that's appalling. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's also um, part of the system that we live in, is that once you finish high school, you don't even have to have a good grade as long as you finish high school and you understand how to speak English and how to write English, you can get a job in the oil industry. And our, our community, uh, our people, you know, the, the region in Fort McMurray says, you know, it's important uh, that we hire locally, very important. Um, so, you know, being raised outside of the, that aspect of being First Nation, mm -hmm. Reminds me actually of a story that I have about uh, 
I traveled to Australia. I went down to Australia for six months. Hitchhike around down there, got a, a rail pass for six months, and had a really good time. One of the most interesting things, though, was seeing the Aboriginal people of Australia. And I don't call them Aborigines because, for me, that's a, a derogatory term. I call them they're Aboriginal people. And looking at them, and they're they're in the the town squares. You know, literally, they have town squares there. It's, weird it's like England all over again <laughs> and um, a lot of them have just got skinny little legs they got distended their their bellies are all big and round and you know they're unhealthy and they're drinking and that's what the people the non-native people see and I saw that but at the same time I went to the um, art galleries and I saw their beautiful art I didn't understand their art and that, you know, uh, they started to t started to, for me to think about the culture of where that art came from because I've always had an affection towards art, especially paintings. And uh, I started to look at that culture and I realized, you know what, I come from a culture of artists and a culture of Aboriginal people. And that's when I realized, you know, I got a really strong traditional community back home that's, you know, that there's a rebirth in our community and um, so I came back with that whole idea that I'm going to look into what it is to be First Nations because I wasn't raised in that environment so much. We, we'd go back and visit and we felt at home once we got there because all my cousins, my, my grandparents were there, all my aunties, all of them lived in the, in the, in the average or in Fort Mackay in the community there. So, you know, I, I'm part of both worlds very strong part of both worlds actually and it's a nice segue into your art because um, from this book and from whatever you're working on now it's it's powerful it's just so absolutely powerful so do you want to share with us some of your favorite pieces and maybe the story behind it and because it's in your book you also talk about um, how you manifest this in words and, and pictures basically so when I asked you about um, teachings for your children, it might well be teachings for all of us because you do it in your artwork. Yeah. All right. I went to university. As I was traveling for a year and a half, Australia, Mexico, all over Canada and the States, 1989-1990. And I thought, well, I just can't keep traveling now. This is ridiculous. I'm just going from town to town. I'm living out of a backpack, which, I, you know, all my stuff is in my backpack. And it's pretty damn heavy because I got my camera equipment because I took, I carried camera equipment wherever I went, and then I got some film developed. And I, was, it, I wouldn't let anybody pick up my backpack. This was really heavy, good 60 pounds at least. Mm. And um, I, I thought, you know, I just can't continue doing this. What am I going to do? So I thought, well, I'll be a photographer. And I realized, you know, you have to set some goals. And I thought, just the silliest idea came. Well, if I'm going to be a photographer, I love sports. I loved hockey back then. Can't stand it now, but I loved it back then. I thought, well, I love the Toronto Maple Leafs. I'm going to be the photographer for the Toronto Maple Leafs. That was my goal. <laughs> Silly goal, but hey, I, you know, it was one of those things. And... Uh, so I went to university and I spent two years literally studying photography. The history of photography, black and white, composition, uh, you know, how, how to pull the black and white images, how to make darks and lights and all that. And, and I was in the dark room. I remember days and days and winter and a couple of winters and it's like you go in the dark room, you go in and it's just starting to get light outside in the morning. And then when you come out, it's just starting to get dark. So you're in the dark room. You you live in the you sleep and you you know winter times are long and and uh, the days are short and um, I just thought ah, this sucks. And then when I was working for Trans Canada Pipeline, you know I always go back to the oil industry. There's a lot of things that happened there. I was able to. I remember reading about the Kleinberg. There's a museum there called McMichael, McMichael Art Gallery. And I've always loved the Group of Seven. Uh, Lauren Harris and Franklin Carmichael are my two favorite uh, painters in the Group of Seven. And so I thought, okay, I went there, 
and um, by this time I you know we studied art history and we in university and looked at some paintings and stuff because yeah you, you have to take some options and stuff so uh, did the um, I don't know it's, it's not a very big gallery but I went through it took me a long time and all of a sudden I walked up stairs went up this long ramp kind of thing and there was this Aboriginal art gallery probably about twice the size of your 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 little domain here and um, there was a little painting there called Old Mike by Arthur Schilling and it was so beautiful and the and 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 it just touched my heart I tell you what that that painting of that old man I think it it harkened back to my grandfather there, there's just so much uh, similarities between the two and I just I just saw the light off the face I saw the character of that person I saw his community and just it's just a simple painting of a face and for me I just sat there for two hours looking at this one painting and it struck me I don't want to be a photographer anymore I'm going to be a painter so I switched my ma uh, my major and I went into painting and I was lucky enough that um, from that moment I uh, was able to sell my work because it's important if an artist is going to be a painter or an artist is going to make a living at it they got to sell their work of course I talk about CAPA the Calgary Albert Jones Professional Association and that whole idea of meeting business people you know this is just a idea for artists out there if they're watching this get involved with business adventures or business business ventures or helping business people out because you meet people with money and I you know I just uh, anyways I became an artist so that's how it started with photography it started with photography but obviously you had an aptitude and a talent for it yeah for, for the transition from a lens to a brush yeah. In a canvas. Yeah, well, when I was a little boy, I, was, I remember being about eight years old, and my brother Roland, who's since passed on in 1990, you know, we were very close, but at the, when he was younger, he was smaller than me, and so I would um, make him sit for me. He <laughs> said, I'd try his face. <laughs> and, you know, he said, Are we done yet? I said, No, no, one more, one more. And be an hour or so sitting there drawing him. And, you know, he put up with that. and. You know, it was like um, I was happy. I was happy to show these to my father because my father was a very good artist. I remember um, when we were little kids living on the banks of the Athabasca River, way up north, like it got to be 100, 100 miles north of Fort McMurray. And he, he showed me a little plane that he had, a bush plane that he had carved out of the wood that he had found on the banks of the river, the bark uh, of a poplar tree. and. He, you know, it's very malleable. It's easy to carve, but he, he I, I remember it being like, did he buy that? But, you know, it, it's like um, one of those things. So my, uh, you know, I was happy to show my father these things and my mother, and I was, uh, yeah, unfortunately, I don't have those drawings to this day, but uh, it started. It started way back when the transition for me wasn't really a transition, which is a continuation more than a transition. Yeah, it almost sounds like a moment of arrival. Yeah. You, you had that in you, then you had to do these adventures and travels. Yeah. And then it kind of found you again. Well, I think if you're going to be a good artist, um, I noticed this in, in, co in the university setting, is that probably the better artists had more experience. The better writers have more experience. Unfortunately, uh, a lot of people come out of universities and they've memorized the words of other people. So they're regurgitating what they've learned in university, but they're not, they're not talking about their own experiences. And for me, I have a lot of experiences. I've, I've done a lot of stuff in my life, but you know, I've been very lucky with that, and I thank the Creator all the time, and uh, you know, I talk to the cosmos in my own way, and I say thank you for that. And um, very important uh, for artists to, to experience life as, and rather than read about life. That speaks to your sense that you have something to say and something to contribute. It's a tough question, but do you know what that is? <laughs> okay, well. <laughs> you know, because that's yeah. a little bit unfair because it manifests itself in drawing, and I'm asking you to do it in okay. words. Talk about Aboriginal business 
briefly again. When I was an artist, I noticed that Aboriginal businesses dealing with non-Aboriginal businesses were making a lot of headway. And as I got into the Aboriginal business community, I, uh, you know, the, there was, you, you, we talked to non-Native people, non-Aboriginal people, and then you start sharing your culture with them, and they become interested. They, they want to learn more. You know, this not not every one of them, because uh, in the in the north in in the Fort, Fort McMurray or the Wood Buffalo region where I'm from, is that if you align your if a company aligns themselves with the Aboriginal business, they have a better chance of making uh, a business success successful. So, I uh, definitely uh, learned that we need. Anyways, what was the question? I forgot. about what you have to say. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, you know, oh, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> it's okay. Buried, following that thought that you, the thread that you started in some of your, in one of your paintings, it it almost spoke to what you were describing. It's two men in an office looking over a desk, and in behind them, there's two paintings. So right. one is of the oil sands, and the other one's of a river. And it's almost the juxtaposition of the two in the same space was was stark contrast. Right. Um, so maybe that was an attempt to bridge the two cultures oh, yeah, or okay. put the two cultures in the same space at the same right. time. Yeah, I get I get so I digress so often. I tell <laughs> you what. But the thing for me is is that um, sharing my culture is important. It, I you know I don't want to talk about me. It's not about me as an artist. It's about the culture. It's about I want to educate, I'd like to educate people. I'd like them to see what Aboriginal people are about. And I made a decision after doing a few paintings that were very angry that I wasn't going to do that anymore because not all Native people are angry about the world, are angry about what's going on, about the corporations, about white people coming here. You know, uh, I wanted to paint more of a positive aspect about it. And the sharing of the ideas of, of our people was very important for me to, to get that across. So, you know, I, I started to, um, once I changed, it really became exciting that people wanted to listen and hear what I had to say. Can you imagine going into an environment where you're, you, 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 you piss on a, a person's ideas because they're non-native? Well, you're not going to get anywhere. <laughs> so... You know, I had a friend who worked in uh, Shell Canada, and I stood outside and waved placards because about uh, because of the uh, the things that Shell was doing in other countries, and you know, and and all the hardships they were causing on the indigenous communities there. And I asked him why he works with Shell, and he says, "Oh, he says it's easy for me. He says it's if you're going to make change, you work from within." So that was a good, very good learning point. I stopped waving placards at that point because they weren't getting anywhere. You know, you wave a placard and you uh, don't do this, don't do this. You're causing all this problem. The, most of those people don't have, well, back then, don't have ideas on how to fix the problem. They just want to say there's a problem. So as I paint and when I'm doing these paintings, you know, painting that one fella, for instance, uh, his name is David Boucher. You know, he's also sharing his culture. He's he's working with these non-native people, and they share the culture, and you know, they they get together, and and there's partnerships formed. And then, you know, if there's a situation in the in in, in the environment, uh, you can talk to them because there's, these are friends, and they, you know, you business people are, are friends. They become friends. They become partners. It's like uh, William Butler Yeats said one time. Strangers are friends we just haven't met yet. And that's anywhere in the world, I've taken that with me. And when I talk about art, and I talk about native people, and I talk about the cultures, I want to do it in a way that people want to hear it. I don't want to beat the shit out of them with you know what happened 500 years up to 1992, I think it is. You know, I. I let's move forward from that point of view. It was really tough for our people. And at the same time, there were some good things that came out of that. But you know what? Um, you have to, there's a book out there uh, written by, I think his name is Charles Mann, uh, 1493. 
1491. I'm kind of dyslexic that way. I can't remember. Okay. Anyways, I think it was 1491 or 92. Anyways, very good book. Talks about how many pe Aboriginal people have lived in North America. Could be as many as 100 million. 10 million to 100 million. And after the Europeans came here, there were anywhere up to 90% gone through smallpox, and tuberculosis, and all these dis foreign diseases, or through basically uh, genocide. Hmm. That's somebody else to talk about that. I want to talk about what's happening now, wh where the positive aspects are. You know, when I touched on the fact about m my community at one time, you know, the dysfunctionality that lived within it. Well, now it's not there anymore. We have, uh, Fort Mackay is right here. There's a river that goes right by our, our, our place. The oil industry takes out of that river the water that it needs to make the oil. And over here is uh, one oil company. Over there, three or four over here. There's another one up here north of us, and there's two south of us. We're surrounded by oil companies. But having said that, the employment factor, the self-esteem, the rebirth of a, of, of a, a strong self-esteem, strong family core. It's very interesting how uh, economics plays such a major role in people being self-sufficient, people being a strong community, strong spirits. And I've seen the difference. And it's, you know, at one point, I think there might have been 20% employment when I was a kid. Now there's like 95% employment. So it's completely changed around, and, you know, people like uh, our chief, um, Jim Boucher, um, it's, you know, he's had a vision to make uh, our community strong by growing uh, our businesses. People, there's been success stories. There's a f quite a few in our community of our millionaires now because of the, the oil industry. But most are middle class. We have really nice homes. Uh, you know, that comes from chief and council. We don't have to buy our homes. We pay rent. You know, it's it's a few dollars a month. It's just enough to cover the uh, the bank, right, the borrowing. We don't pay a lot. We, we There's benefits to working with the oil industry and partnering with them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I talk, when you talk about the, the that painting, that's what it's about. It's about sharing the positive aspects of what our people, where our culture is now. Right. Very important for me to do that. Thank you for that. It was a very kind and a very in-depth and unique. And a lot of the audience might not have heard that perspective before. So much uh, gratitude. We've got about five minutes left. And I, when we were prepping to do the show, um, you got very animated. And I would like to you to share again. Um, one of your favorite paintings, which is of your grandfather, yes. and that story behind it. So if you could fan through, and we'll put it up on the screen, mm -hmm. but if I can find it here, because you, it was awesome. Do you remember where you put yeah, it in? Yeah, keep going, keep going, keep going. It's absolutely stunning. Oh, pull back. There it is. There it is. So I'll do a quick version this way, right. so you got sort of a look, but we'll put the full thing up. But please, please share again what, what that's about for okay. you. It's wonderful. Actually, this is a painting that I did where my grandfather is signing a contract with a company to go on his land and survey it. They, give him, they gave him so much money. You know, he was happy. He was an old man. He needed the money. At the same time, he realizes that uh, by doing this, he's going to, you know, that they're going to go on to onto the trap line and, and scare away the animals. He had to come to a, to a balance in his own heart of where he wanted to be with that. Because I'm sure he's seen the future, and I'm sure he knew that it was going to change. And But he comes from a long line. You know, his clothes were ratty. You know, that money he got made a big difference in his life. He got him a new motor for his canoe, or his, um, his little 16-foot canoe. Got him some gas, you know, he's able to go up and down the river all by himself and kept him, you know, kept him in the bush. It, 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 it allowed him a chance to continue living the life that he had chosen. 
This is in a painting, you know, one of the very few paintings that I've done where there's been 12 layers of paint on it. And as you get closer to the face or to the hands, I put a lot of emphasis in both hands and face when I'm painting. And um, the colors start to trickle out like little stars twi twinkling in the night or little pops of colors. And it's really quite a, 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 for me it was a very interesting painting because at the same time I'm thinking about him, I'm thinking about, you know, is this painting going to be liked by somebody or another? First person that saw the, saw the painting bought it. It was like almost instant. And actually the person that bought it, him and I have become very good friends. Actually his name uh, is Mike Robinson and he writes an article in Troy Media online. And he's like you, he, he, he pretty much talks about what it is that's on his mind and shares those stories. And you know, he's not sponsored by anybody. So he can, he can have a really open discussion and hit where it needs to be hit. Because, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm talking about the media is another, we can go on another route, and you've <laughs> talked about it already. And you know what? It, th this painting for me is probably one of the best I've ever done. What emotions were going through you as you painted that? Just thinking about the stories, thinking about when I was a little boy uh, in front of the potbelly fire. Uh, in, the, in our little cabin. Our little cabin, I think, was 16 feet by 16 feet. And lying there on the floor, on my knees, and it's 30, 40 below outside, and the wind is blowing, and the snow banks are coming right up to the windows. And he's telling his stories. So that, you know, just listening to the stories. And um, always going to sleep every night. If there's, there was company, they would be talking. You know, the, the, the old people, they love talking about the past. That's what you do when you get old, that you talk about the past. I know, because I, I, I always say, yeah, I remember when, because I'm a golf nut, and I says, I remember when I used to be able to drive at 330 yards, and, and uh, it's, you know, it's like, and then my, one of my buddies who's a young guy, he says, yeah, that's just an old man talking. I go, yeah, I am an old man now. So, you know, I, I know what it's like, and I, and I like that, being able to share my stories. and. Um, you know, I'm, I write poetry now, and I'm sharing those stories in my poems, and I'm talking about those kind of things, and um, I'm, I'm branching off into another medium now, so. Great. Any final thoughts? Yeah, I, um, you know, our world is changing. And as an artist and as a person of the world, I'm really concerned about it. You know what's going on with the fires in California. The Fort McMurray had that great, the big, the the beast, the fire two years ago. You know we're going to have a, we're going to, the Midwest is going to be a desert. It's all going to be dried right up. Going to be droughts all through North America and right up into Canada. And we're going to, you know, we're going to have, there's going to be waters in certain areas. And it's, it's one of those things, uh, people. For some reason, I just don't get the feeling that people realize this is happening. They think, I, I think people think this is happening to somebody else. It's not going to happen to me, but it's going to happen to everybody. The waters are going to rise in the ocean because you, you, you look at a picture of the ice caps, how they're decreased by at least a third now. The Antarctic ice cap is, you know, the, the, the continent itself is decreasing. The waters are rising. You know, all those countries in the South Pacific are going to, some of them is like Guam. It's, I think the highest part of Guam is like 40 feet or something. You know, you can't have all the thousands of people living in one, one little hill. You know, it's like, yeah, so for me it's about how do I make, how do we make as a community, not, you know, because we have, there's a lot of people like you and me out there who care about what's going on and uh, who want to bring in awareness and say, this is gonna happen to us right here. Anybody who's sitting here, if you go to Burger Joint or you go to a restaurant or you go to a mall, this is gonna happen to every one of us. We're gonna have hard times in the future. So when I talk to my kids, I say, be prepared. So, and, and I tell them, if you can help out, if you can get involved, do it. Thank you. Thank you.
and thank you for watching. As always, be good, have fun, and love each other. We'll be done.